Today on the G3 Sportsman, it's all about the ducks. Well, not the flying kind, but the sitting kind. Yeah, we're gonna be talking about decoys. And not just any decoys, but we're gonna be talking about carved decoys. And what it's all about right here. You don't wanna miss this right here. It's kinda neat, it's, it's really interesting, and you're gonna meet some of the people out here that are some of the best duck decoy carvers in the world. Right here on today's G3 Sportsman. Don't wanna miss it. The G3 Sportsman is presented by Yamaha. Reliability starts here. You know, we all use decoys when it comes to our duck hunting and whatnot, and a lot of them started a long time ago by just being hand carved. Well, today we are at the Pacific Flyway Decoy Association meeting and banquet and show featuring some of the top carvers and all their decoys that they carve. And it's a, it's a great show. A lot of these happen throughout the year and everything. And just so happen we have to be in Sacramento, California for this particular show right here. So let's go in and take a look at it and see all the neat little features and all the stuff that it takes to make these great collector and usable decoys. Well, this show is our 30th year here at this venue in Sacramento. It's our 43rd, I believe, 44th show. Uh, since we started the club. And there are a number of organizations around the state that, or the country that do this. We're the second oldest in the country. It's a celebration of wildlife art, which is what we are about. So what you'll see at our show is a, a collective of opportunities for people to bring their decoys and their fish and their carvings to participate. Uh, we have people that come from all over the country to participate. This is a national carving competition. Hi, I'm Bob Soleri. I'm the Vice President of the Pacific Flyway Decoy Association. I've been uh, a judge for a number of years as well as I'm a carver myself. One of the first things that we look for with any of the birds, in fact, is some degree of likeness to the species that you're dealing with. In this case, we're dealing with a mallard hand. And to begin with, to be able to float on the water and float correctly, you need to have what we call is a keel. There are different styles of keels, but this happens to be what this particular carver used. What we look for, in addition to likeness of species, is the construction and how the carver put this together. And it needs to be of tough construction so that it can stand the bumping and, br and damaging uh, chips, nicks, etc. that happens when it's in a decoy bag, or for that matter, out on the water when it's being used as a hunting piece. What we're looking for um, while we're judging in the tank is um, our initial reaction to the birds. Do the birds um, conform to um, the species they're trying to portray? And then we're also looking at how they handle. Do they sit in the water well? Do they swim well? So we're looking for color, we're looking for shape, we're looking for the general effect or the general um, import of the bird. Is, is the bird saying what it's supposed to say? And that's, that's what we're looking for while we're judging. competition is open to the public. Uh, we encourage people to participate. We have some, obviously, we're a club, so if you're a member of the club, we have some perks that go with that. If you're interested in, in uh, being involved in one of these or seeing one of these shows, there are a number of them happen around the, happen around the country. The IWCA website has the list of all the contests across the country. Come and see us. We'd love to have you here, and I think you'll have a great time. You know, while attending the show, you know, not only did I get to see and meet some of the some of the top decoy carvers in the country, but got to see a lot of their works, how they were judged, uh, where they finished, and and the, the different categories for which you know these these decoys are made. But 
I wanted to see just exactly, just, just a little bit on how they actually carve these decoys or how it gets started. And so we hooked up with a good friend of ours, Brad Snodgrass, out there in Northern California. And uh, he's, he's kind of briefly going to go over a little bit of the rough details on how he gets started in making his own wood decoy. All right, well basically today I'm going to try to give you a little bit of background about how we actually, the steps that we follow in carving a decoy. And like anything else, there's a starting point, and the starting point is always with the raw material. Uh, the raw material in this case for me is a chunk of tupelo wood, uh, which is my preferred carving wood. Um, most carvers prefer either tupelo, basswood, or gelutone, which is a South American wood, but the reason we prefer these woods is because they're soft, but they're durable, they have some strength, and if we get to the decorative point of the carving, of the process, um, they will hold texture. Um, and they won't, this wood, because it grows in water, when you apply paint to it, the grain doesn't swell and you don't lose the texture that you put into it. So anyway, we would then take the rough tupelo um, and cut the rough edges off and square it up into a block. Uh, we do that by bringing it over to the bandsaw, um, obviously lose, using framing squares and things of that nature so that we get a relatively square piece of wood out of it. Um, once we have done that, the next step in the process is to determine what type of bird we're actually going to carve and then try to get that, car, that bird carved to scale. And what I'm looking for is a buffalo head hen where the picture is pretty much straight on sideways. Okay, and this is a good example right here. And you can see how the water line is straight and the bird is, is straight. So that gives me an opportunity to build a pattern off of that. Um, I will develop a, a side pattern and obviously this is not a buffalo head hen. This is a Stellar's Eider Drake that I'm working on for a gunning bird competition at the World Show. But what you can see is that I've developed a side pattern based on the profile that I've seen on the internet. And then I have developed a top pattern also based on that, making sure that the side pattern and the top pattern match. Now also in that process, I have developed the same thing for the head, which is going to be carved separately. So what I would then do is I would take that block of wood over to the bandsaw and cut out the side and top profiles of the bird. And this has been bandsawed. That's what the body would look like after it's cut out on the bandsaw. And this is what the head would look like. So just real quickly, I'll give you a demonstration of how quickly you can remove wood with one of these tools. Uh, this is not the spit and whittle stuff that a lot of people are familiar with. And what I've done is I've defined the side pockets on the bird here. And I'm gonna kind of start by just removing chunks of wood that I know are not going to be part of the, the bird. Okay, this, this is just a quick demonstration of um, what we do when it comes to actually doing a decorative decoy. And you can see that I've begun the process and I'm now back to the point here where I'm uh, working on the tertial feathers and the primary feathers. And what I would do is I would start by creating a feather shaft and that basically consists of two relatively parallel lines that get closer together as you get towards the tip of the feather. And you will see that I have a, a burning tool that's on a rheostat and I have it set on a very, very low setting because I do not really want to burn the wood deeply. I want simply to etch it. Um, I will wind up with possibly as much as 200 hours in a decoy by the time I'm done with it. Because once this process is done, you have plenty of other opportunities to really mess this up with a paintbrush. So a good carver has to master the element of carving the bird to capture the essence of the species, texturing the bird so it actually looks like feathers, and then painting the bird. Okay, and then actually, again, not to confuse the process even further, but uh, here is a, a painted buffalo head hen. And this is done by my good friend, Dennis Schroeder, who is one of the top carvers in the world. Uh, I've been doing this for about 25 years now. I got into it when I was still working full time. Eventually started entering some of the competitions. Um, 
didn't do real well at first, but I learned a lot. And eventually I, I uh, heard about the World Championships were back in Ocean City, Maryland. I attended those for a couple of years and just got a pretty good idea of what the guys were doing and kept honing my skills and working really, really hard. And I, I made a couple of birds and took them back there and entered them and, and wound up winning the, the World Championship that year. And entered it again the following year and, and amazingly won it again. So I won the World Championships twice and after that I decided I better not push my luck. I got nowhere to go but downhill after that. So. I still, I still car full time and I don't really compete anymore, but I do judge and, um, and just totally enjoy it. I'm into things now that I never had done before. I competed mostly with decoys and now I've gotten into what's called Tweety Birds and just having a ball with it. Just, it's just been a, a wonderful experience. This process, you, just, you, you have very transparent paint. As you can see, it's mostly water and you're just building this up gradually. It takes lots and lots of little brush strokes. If you try to come in with too thick a paint on that right off, it just looks terrible. Uh, this is an example of, of a canvas back drake, and um, this would be considered a competition style bird. They're judged according to their anatom anatomy and making sure that they are anatomically correct and painted correct. But, it's just a lot of fun. It doesn't take a lot of tools. You can do it out of your home. Um, and when you get all done with it, invariably you're quite proud of it. And if you, if you don't want to keep it yourself, there's going to be a family member or a friend that would absolutely love to have it. I'm Maury Hicks. Uh, I'm the president of the Pacific Flyway Decoy Association. That's a club of members, about 300 of us, uh, dedicated to the education and promotion of wildlife art. In specific, uh, decoys has been the main focus. We've expanded out to uh, flat work and fish carving and, and it's a group of people that really, really enjoy what they do and very dedicated to uh, educating kids and, and adults. Um, to the art form that we're making. You know, in attending these shows, you know, not only do you see, you know, some of the top carvings in the country, you, you also see some of the top art, uh, whether it be in, in print or a painting or whatnot. There's a lot of top artists around the world that attend some of these shows too, and, and a lot of them that uh, are there for purchase too. So it's, it's a pretty little neat place that you can go to, especially if you're a collector and you really appreciate this kind of stuff. These type of shows right here are something that, uh, that, are, that are pretty neat. This guy has put in, or maybe it's a woman, has put in a whole set of federation in here to bring out the individual feather group characteristics of birds. When we're in judging, we look for this. If you're in a traditional honey decoy, you don't want a lot of detail. In contrast to when we have a decorative piece, where in fact the fragile parts are allowed, but the fine fancy painting is what's encouraged. Bottom line, when it sits on the water and floats, does it look like a hen mallard? The, the birds that people carve to bring to the show, it's obviously an extension of their own life, uh, their passion. Uh, you can see it in their work. Each of us develops a, a very individualized style and we have an affinity for a, a type of bird or or the reason that we started carving in the very first place. Uh, the pride factor is one of the neat things. I had, I had a friend tell me a while back that he kind of thought this is kind of how you have immortality, that you're going to create something that you love. You're going to either sell it or give it to somebody that you care about. They're going to really like it and they're going to keep passing that on. And in some ways you have immortality because 50 years from now somebody's going to pick up one of my carvings and look at the name and they're going to go, who is this, who is this guy? And maybe PFDA might be that organization that's going to help keep that record. Um, we attract some of the absolute best carvers in America to our show. It's uh, really unique and you're going to have a good time. You know, back in the day, just about everybody carved, uh, whittled out or whatnot their own decoys. And I mean, it just goes back centuries. Uh, 
the uh, early Americans and Indians and whatnot use these decoys in, in order to, to draw in the birds. And, and I'll, I'll bet somewhere that uh, you had one as a kid or you know of your granddaddy or whatever that's had some of those old decoys. And, and uh, it, it's, it's pretty neat to look at them, the old rough edges and, and uh, not, not a lot of beauty in them or whatever else, but I'll tell you what, they, they served a purpose back in the day. And uh, it, it took somebody time in order to carve out all these. And, and really a lot of them didn't really look e extremely well because if you got to whittle out a couple of dozen, <laughs> I would imagine one looks a whole lot different than number 24. But uh, y'all to check her out in your, in your attic or, or around your grandpa's place or, or whatever and dig up on these old decoys right here and just think of the history that uh, this bad boy right here has. You're in my studio, and this is a fish I'm uh, reproducing for a friend that I watch catch. It's a, a rather large steelhead. It's uh, been a work in progress. Uh, but when I first started carving, I carved in the corner of my garage, a little wooden table. And so it uh, became a center of my life. My daughter's first word was duck. You know, it, it, it's, it's the type of thing where you can enjoy it no matter what your skill level, no matter your age. Uh, most of the guys I have in my classes are retired fellows and they, they don't have any real aspirations of making a lot of money off of these things or you know, necessarily even producing a, a real quality bird, but they have a tremendous time with it. And one of the things that you'll notice is that an advanced carver or an artist like Dennis recognizes that there are numerous values of color within a feather. And we often say there are three values, starting from the leading edge of the feather to the middle to the base of the feather. And it's capturing those transitions of feather that create that issue or that um, feeling of softness, the appearance of softness. This was our first adventure out to that part of the country. Beautiful, beautiful area in there. And I'm talking about north of uh, Redding, California. And each one of these little towns kind of looks the same. They're, they're real quaint. They're unique. They're different from anything that I'm used to out in the Midwest. And uh, just, a, just a cool place to go visit. And uh, I highly suggest uh, if you're ever looking for a, a destination for a, you know, for a vacation or whatnot, check out Northern California. I, I, I think you'll really be pleased. And there's so much out there to see. But I got a, uh, an invitation to go to a San Diego show, a carving show went down there and saw what these guys were doing out of wood and I was absolutely just blown away. Couldn't believe it. So I got some tools and a couple of how-to books and started carving and never intended to do anything more than just kind of putter around with it and made my first bird or two and by golly I sold one. And then all of a sudden things started changing a little bit and you think, well maybe there is a market for this. We do a, we do a unique category that we call doubtful antiques and we encourage people to kind of think outside the box. They can't copy an old decoy, but they create their decoys. And the whole idea is to make it look like it's something you found that was 50 years old. Uh, it's, uh, you never know what's gonna show up through the door coming to the show, and that's part of the exciting part of where, where we head to. The bill, and the measurement that's key for us is from the top of the common, which is the top of the bill, to the center of the eye, and believe it or not, that is where the entire carving process starts. So whether you're a novice carver and would just carve a little decoy about like this, or you become a world champion carver and you can make a fine decoy like this bluebill right here that my friend Dennis Schroeder made. It doesn't really matter. Uh, it it just, just takes a little time and a little desire, a little dedication, and I tell you what, uh, you, you never know in today's market because you see all these shows about picking and antiquing and garage sales or whatever else. You find all these old decoys out here somewhere, whether it be like this or like this, someday they're going to be worth a ton of money and you're going to wish that you'd pick these up. But you know, that's all the time we got for this week's show. Hope you enjoyed it and just remember, we're going to be out there somewhere doing something right here on the G3 Sportsman. Thanks for watching. And that is a beautiful, beautiful bluebill.
Oh, probably. No? Well, I got the pocket on it, right? Back. Yeah, I got it right. Yeah. It wouldn't be unusual for me to have it on the inside out. Yeah, I don't think it really no. matters. Yeah. <laughs> and that's pretty much, and you can see, you make a lot of sawdust.